The last two groups of plants that we're going to look at are considered seed plants because they have a true seed. So a seed is going to require an embryo, right? So this is the baby plant. It needs to have a food supply um, because it is enclosed in some side of protective um, coat, right? So that would be like the shell of the seed. The first characteristic is we're going to continue to reduce the gametophyte generation. So going back to the bryophytes, those were the uh, true mosses, the non-vascular plants, these had a dominant gametophyte and a very small sporophyte. And then as we continue to do this trend, when we look at the seedless vascular plants, they had a small gametophyte, so they finally had a dominant uh, sporophyte. But the, the gametophyte was like a small plant. You would be able to see it with the naked eye. And then now we're going to get to the seed plants, and the gametophyte is even smaller. So the gametophyte is going to be microscopic at this point. It's really teeny tiny. And it's actually going to be retained completely within inside the tissue of the parent sporophyte. So this is our diploid plant, and the haploid gametophyte is going to stay inside of the diploid plant. And so this is totally new because in the seedless plants, uh, the gametophyte was able to be kind of separate and outside. And because it stays inside, it's able to help be protected from environmental stress. So things like UV light, desiccation, um, having to search for its own nutrients. Uh, the sporophyte can actually provide nutrients to the gametophyte. The seedless vascular plants, the gametophyte was on its own. It had to develop its own nutrient absorption methods. Whereas now we can actually create a link from the sporophyte parent plant to the newly developed gametophyte to help it develop. The next characteristic that is different in seed plants is heterospory. So hetero means different. And then spory is talking about spores. And up until now, the spores have been kind of monoecious, meaning that they were all just one gener uh, kind of gender. Um, now we're going to see that there are two distinct spores that are going to produce female gametophytes and male gametophytes. So megasporangia is going to give rise to megaspores, which will eventually give rise to uh, ovules and eggs that are going to be the female um, gametophytes. So I like to remember mega is big. If you think about human reproduction, we have one big eggs are big. Microsporangia creates microspores that give rise to male gametophytes. Um, I remember this because the male reproductive um, in humans, so specifically sperm, are very small. So micro. So you can remember mega is female because eggs are female and they're big. Micro is male because sperm is male and it is small. The third new characteristic are the ovules. So these are new because now we have these heterosporous uh, productions that we can make uh, specifically female structures and specifically male structures. So ovules and the production of eggs. An ovule, so here's a pine cone. This would be a female pine cone. And each of these pine little kind of leaflets here has a single ovule. There's an ovule, there's an ovule, there's an ovule. So here's the whole ovule. This is going to contain the megasporangium, right? Mega is female. So this megasporangium is this part right here. And you can see that this is diploid, so this is part of the sporophyte. It's also going to contain the megaspore. So now this is haploid, so this is our female spore. Um, so this is part of our gametophyte and then one or, or more protective integuments. Um, so the integument is this kind of covering here. The integument comes from the parent uh, sporophyte. So this is gonna be uh, diploid, you can see 2N. 
Gymnosperms typically only have one integument. Angiosperms will typically have two integuments, and that's one characteristic that's going to distinguish these two different groups. Eventually, when this is fertilized, so this megaspore is going to become uh, the egg, and then it will be able to be fertilized by the male gametophyte, and then eventually become the emb embryo. So here you can see the, this gametophyte was maintained inside of the parent, and then it develops into a new plant embryo inside of the parent, and then this is the seed coat, which can then be dispersed. Uh, the fourth characteristic, again, is the male uh, gametes, because we now have these heterosporous um, production. So we've got our microspore is going to develop into a pollen grain. So a pollen grain is going to have a pollen wall, which is the outside that's going to protect it. And then inside will be uh, usually two different cells uh, that are the gametophyte. Pollination is what's happening right here. When a pollen grain lands on a female structure, so this is the stigma of a female and this is the pollen. When it lands here, that's pollination. It hasn't actually fertilized yet, so the sperm actually has to get from the pollen grain all the way down to, this is my female megasporangium with my megaspores inside of here. So this is showing a angiosperm. This is a flowering plant. Uh, one of the cells called the tube cell actually creates this big long pollen tube. And you can see it develop all the way over here. And then the two sperm nuclei will actually travel down the tube and then fertilize. The sperm in seed plants, so gymnosperms and amniosperms, no longer need water. These are not flagellated because they are traveling through this tiny tube with inside the parent, the female parent sporophyte. Um, so they don't actually need a film of water. Once this develops into a seed, it can be dispersed by animals. Pollen itself is dispersed by animals. Um, it can be great distances or it can be light enough to float on air that you no longer see the need for flagellated sperm. And then the fifth characteristic of seed plants is obviously what they get their name from, seed. And seeds are a huge advantage over spores. So up until these groups, the bryophytes and those seedless vascular plants, the only way that they transported their gametes was through spores. Now we've been able to close the spores into pollen and we've been able to create uh, seeds. So again, a seed has three specific parts. It is a sporophyte embryo, so that's a 2N little baby plant. It has a food supply and a protective coat, so this would be kind of the seed coat. And if it has all of those things, we would consider it a seed. Um, seeds have many advantages over spores. They can remain dormant for a really long period of time. So we can have this healthy two diploid sporophyte that doesn't have to immediately find a place to land. Um, it can land on the ground and stay dormant for weeks or months or years. There's evidence that the longest dormant um, seed that we've been able to count has been dormant for up to a thousand years and then still flower or um, germinated after that. They have a food storage supply. This is expensive for the parent plant to make, um, but it's built in so that when the seed actually finds a good environment, it's going to already have a food supply to start out with. Um, so that's going to make the really delicate seedling phase a little bit easier. Seeds can also be transported really far. So seeds can be eaten by animals. Animals, birds can fly very far distances. They can typically survive all the way through a digestive tract um, and then be excreted in a very different place um, inside of a very nutritious packet of fertilizer often of excrement fertilizer. 
and that creates a really nice environment for that seed to blossom. Uh, there are seeds that will only germinate after a fire. So there are seeds that have different specific um, environmental needs for germination, and usually those create some kind of advantage for the seedling that's going to develop um, to be able to more likely grow into a successful seedling and then full-on plant. 